Well, like many others, I've been watching the Jordan Peterson phenomenon with a certain fascination. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you don't spend a lot of time on social media because um, Jordan Peterson, who is a uh, kind of understated uh, psychology professor from the University of Toronto, has emerged as one of the hottest personalities uh, on the internet. His lectures and presentations, which are kind of cool and brainy and uh, understated, are watched and commented upon by millions of people, especially, I might say, young men. Um, his new book, 12 Rules for Life, is number one bestseller pretty much all over the world. Um, in his native Canada, he's emerged as kind of a controversial figure because of his opposition to the imposition of speech codes around the you know, transgender issue and all that. Made him a, a hero uh, to many and made him a right-wing ideologue to others. Uh, just recently, he did an interview with uh, Kathy Newman from Channel 4 over in, uh, in Britain, and uh, it's become kind of a, a co-celeb because uh, she reveals herself pretty much as a, as a left-wing ideologue. And that uh, interview has been, been viewed now by, I think it's 7.5 million people as I record uh, these words. So uh, who is Jordan Peterson and what's, uh, what's he all about? I think one way to get a handle on him is he's doing uh, for this generation what someone like Joseph Campbell did for uh, a previous generation, namely to present the archetypal psychology of C.G. Jung in a way that's very appealing and very um, provocative. So. Jung, of course, the famous disciple of Sigmund Freud, articulates this depth psychology based upon the idea of the archetypes of the collective unconscious. It call them these, these fundamental memories and instincts and, and ideas that um, uh, influence at a, at a profound level our, our behavior, can also appear in our myths and our stories and our, our religions and our rituals, etc. So unpacking the meaning of these archetypes it was key to Jung and is now key to Jordan Peterson. And the Jungian template has enabled him to read a lot of the classic texts of our tradition, including and especially religious texts, the biblical texts, in a very fresh way that people are finding extremely appealing. Mind you, texts that are often dismissed as you know, old hat or you know, old myths and patriarchal legends and all that, he's been able to breathe life into them uh, through the Jungian template. So that's a big part of, of his work. Uh, the new book I just finished reading, uh, 12 Rules for Life, uh, makes for a, a pretty bracing and satisfying reading, I think. It's a, someone assuming the mantle, I would say, of, of spiritual father. And he's speaking, I think, especially to younger people about, you know, rules. Life is not just a matter of, of you know, self-expression, and I, I make it up as I go along, but there are these rules that are grounded in our psychological and physical structure that you can see up and down the centuries of the tradition. And Peterson kind of moves boldly into that space of, of spiritual teacher. Um, I can't begin to, to uh, discuss in detail all the riches of this book, but I'll just say a couple things. Uh, an idea that runs uh, really all the way through the book is the play between order and chaos. And Peterson uh, says that the, the Tao symbol, you know, the circle with the kind of the intertwining fish they look like, um, the yin and yang uh, symbol, is, is an evocation of this. That consciousness exists as a kind of balancing act between order, which is what we can know, what we can control, what's given to us by society, but then chaos which stands for the unknown, the unexplored, what, what is coming next. See, and too much order leads to a kind of breakdown, to a sort of petrifying of the psyche and eventually of the society, where everything is just set in place. Too much disorder, of course, too much chaos, also leads to a, a psychic breakdown. Talk to people now that have fallen into simply a, a, a state of anxiety or depression. So, Healthy consciousness, the yin and the yang, the play between order and chaos, is a key theme, he thinks, in much of the uh, religion and mythology of the world. It enables him also to explain uh, many of these myths of the hero, which you can find across the world and across the cultures. Mind you, in most of these stories, now, I mean from the Epic of Gilgamesh all the way to you know, Bilbo Baggins, um, what you find usually is, is the hero who leaves or is compelled out of domesticity, the realm of complete order. Think of, of um, 
Bilbo Baggins, right, in the Shire, in his cozy little domestic space. Or think of, of Luke Skywalker again, who's living with his aunt and uncle in cozy domesticity. And then they're compelled, or they're invited, or they're forced to move into the realm of disorder or chaos, uh, on an adventure, into the unknown. And if the hero has the courage to undergo this test, he'll bring back something of enormous value to uh, um, his domestic space. You know, think too of, of Plato's uh, parable of the cave is similar. Someone who escapes from the restriction of the cave and moves out into the realm of the unknown, but then brings back uh, this knowledge of the forms to where he was. Okay, so that rhythm can be seen in the great stories. Now here's what I think is really intriguing in, in Peterson, is he will say, mind you again, especially to young men, act like a hero. <laughs> in other words, internalize these, these stories in such a way that you can move out of the, the, the simple domestic space boldly and heroically into the unknown. Don't despise order and don't be overly afraid of the unknown. And in that space, you'll find the heroic task, the heroic vocation. And I think that's really a, a neat thing uh, for anybody, especially young men, uh, to abide by. Uh, another thing that jumped out at me in the book was his analysis of uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. So here's this figure, one of the most tortured souls of the 20th century, a victim of both Hitler and Stalin, uh, for decades a prisoner in the Gulag archipelago, someone that suffered under the great tyrannies of the 20th century. How easy it would have been for Solzhenitsyn simply to curse his fate, uh, to curse God, uh, to bemoan his terrible life. But in fact, what he did, Peterson argues, is he looked within, he did a kind of searching moral inventory, he tried to set his own life right, even acknowledging, even acknowledging some small role he played in the early years of, of supporting the Stalinist tyranny. And that kind of honesty, that searching spiritual honesty, enabled him then to see the world with greater clarity. He got his own house in order, and that enabled him then to see the, the dysfunction of the wider society much more clearly. Then, of course, he publishes his great book, The Gulag Archipelago, it comes out in the 70s in the, in the West, and played a major role in undermining the very tyranny that had uh, oppressed him. And so he takes it to be a, a sign, I think, a very healthy indicator of what we ought to do is before we run around reforming the world, take the time to reform yourself, to get your own house in order, and then you'll find you'll have much clearer and cleaner vision for looking at the rest of the world. I like his uh, little quote. He says, start to stop doing right now what you know to be wrong. So if you want to change the world, look at yourself and say, okay, I'm doing certain things wrong. Stop it. And that little movement can be extraordinarily uh, powerful. Okay. Now, do I think everything is right in Jordan Peterson? <laughs> I, I appreciate this book a lot. It's the first book of his that I've read. I appreciate a lot of his um, talks. I'll just say a quick word here at the end as a, as a Christian um, theologian. Uh, and, and Peterson, to be fair here, doesn't claim to be a Christian theologian. I mean, he's very honest about his starting point. He's a, a depth psychologist. He's reading the great religious text through the, the lenses of that archetypal psychology. And he uncovers great truth. And I, I applaud that. But what worries me a bit is what worried me about Joseph Campbell, what worried me about C.G. Jung, whom I read years ago with great interest. But it's, I'll call it the Gnosticizing tendency. That's to say a tendency to bracket historicity and to uncover the sort of secret or hidden wisdom in these texts. Now whether you do it philosophically as the ancient Gnostics did, or you do it more psychologically as Jung and Campbell and, and Peterson do, uh, the danger is a bracketing of the historical referent in these biblical texts. Now this would take you know another 12 videos adequately to, to get into, but it matters immensely for Christian theology that certain things happened that Jesus really is the incarnation of the Logos. It's not just an archetypal story full of wise uh, patterns of meaning, but that God really became one of us. 
that God really died on the cross and that Jesus rose from the dead through the power of the Holy Spirit. Those are not just uh, archetypal symbols. Those are, are facts of, of history. Anyway, that's where I would maybe engage Jordan Peterson if we had a chance ever to talk about some of these things. Uh, but again, I don't think he's claiming to be doing some kind of exhaustive account of Christian theology. So I don't, I don't really blame him for that. It's just a caution I would have. Uh, on balance, I really like what I read in this book. And I think uh, that message, especially for young men, stand up straight, get your own house in order, act like a hero. Not bad.